this is very encouraging. Uh, I mean, it, it was a long time in coming, but I understand because there are so many people funnier than I am, especially here in Washington. With any luck, they'll soon get voted out and I'll still have the Mark Twain Prize. <laughs> oh, this has been quite a journey. I remember back when I was a kid and I'd make funny faces and cross my eyes and look in the mirror and my grandmother, Nanny, who raised me, she would go, stop that, quit that, nothing will ever come of it. Well, obviously, I completely ignored her advice. And um, see, Nanny and I lived in a one-room apartment a block north of Hollywood Boulevard, but uh, really a million miles away from Hollywood. So we would we'd save our pennies, and we would go to the movies. And back in those days, we'd see double features, and maybe we would even see six to eight movies a week. And I, that, uh, that actually was what I loved the most of all. The movies we saw weren't cynical. No, they weren't. The good guys won, the bad guys didn't. And I fell in love with Betty Grable, Fred and Ginger, Mickey and Judy. They were always putting on a show and getting it to Broadway. And uh, I, the ones I liked best were always optimistic. And there was laughter galore, and there were always happy endings. And it wasn't until I was enrolled at UCLA that I, I got a part in a student production, and that was when I got my very first laugh on stage. I was uh, playing a hillbilly woman, um, and, which was easy for me since I've got a Texas and Arkansas background. So I made my entrance, and my line was, I'm back. <laughs> well, the audience, I mean, they went crazy. They cracked up. They were just, I mean, they, would, they wouldn't stop laughing. You had to be there. And <laughs> from then on, I was hooked. I was hooked on wanting those laughs to keep on coming forever. And my dream was to go to New York and to be in a Broadway show. And as luck would have it, a kind person lent me the money for an airplane ticket to go to New York, and I was on my way. I found a room at the famous rehearsal club, which was a boarding house for about 18 young ladies who were pursuing a theatrical career. Uh, actually, there were four other roommates that I had in the same room. I, we had one small closet and one bathroom, you know, but I didn't lack for company. Anyway, one rainy Saturday night, all four of my roommates were out on dates, and I was sitting on my cot, and I was reading the paper and listening to the radio, when a song from the musical Pajama Game came, was started playing on the radio, and it was just as I turned to the ad in the theater section for this mega hit. And starring in a featured role was Eddie Foy Jr. Now, he was a supreme comedian who had, who had cut his teeth on vaudeville. And uh, he wasn't a professional singer or dancer, but he had the moves and he had the comedy chops. And he was now in the most successful musical on Broadway. Something clicked. A neighbor of ours in Hollywood had been an extra in a movie that Eddie Foy Jr. had been in. And he always said, gee, Eddie was a hell of a swell guy for a movie star. Right then and there, I decided I was going to meet Eddie Foy Jr. and ask him a favor. So I went to the closet, I got my plastic raincoat on, it was really pouring and galoshes and everything, and I walked down the several blocks to the St. James Theater where the pajama game was playing. I got to the stage door and I just before the final curtain, and I slipped in, and I found myself backstage. 
at an actual Broadway theater. I could hear the orchestra playing the finale and the chorus blasting out. And the old doorman looking every inch like, you know, all those old doormen in the movies, you know, they always called him Pops. And uh, so he came over to me and I was dripping water all over from the rain. I looked like the poor man's Eve Harrington from <laughs> All About Eve. Anyway, Pops says to me, yeah, kid, what do you want? And I said, I'm, I'm, here, I'm, I'm here to see Eddie. And he said, you know Eddie? And I said, I'm from California. <laughs> and Pop said, okay, wait here, show's almost over. At that point, I heard what sounded like a clap of thunder, and it was applause. And the audience was going wild, and suddenly I saw the stars running into the wings back and forth and back and forth, taking their bows. And when they finished, they headed for their dressing rooms and the audience was still cheering. And I was mesmerized. I mean, is this what it's like? And then right before me, there he was, Eddie Ford Jr. And Pop said, hey Eddie, this kid wants to see you. And Eddie said, comes up to me and he says, yeah kid, what do you want? I said, well, Mr. Foy, a friend of mine from California, where I just came from, worked with you in a movie. He was an Irish cop in the movie. Remember him? And anyway, he said that you were a real swell guy and that maybe you could give me uh, some advice when I get to New York and you could tell me on how I could get into show business. You see, I can't get a job unless I have an agent and I can't get an agent unless I'm in something. Okay, kid. Um, what do you do? You sing? Be kind of. I'm loud. And he said, well, do you dance? And I said, I can jitterbug. And then he said, well, I don't know, maybe I could get you a, an audition here for chorus replacement. And I said, but M Mr. Foy, I, I, I don't read music and I can't really dance. And he's looking at me kind of funny and he said, okay, you can't read music, you can't dance, then what? I said, well, I'm not good enough for the chorus, so it looks like I might have to have a featured role. <laughs> well, there was this long pause. <laughs> and then he gave me his agent's name and phone number and wished me luck, and then he made a beeline for his dressing room. So uh, the fact that he didn't laugh me right out of the theater did prove indeed that he was a pretty swell guy. <laughs> anyway, I called his agent the next day and the agent said, let me know when you're in something. So I went back to the rehearsal club and I called a meeting of all the girls and I said, we're going to put on a show. So we organized the whole thing and the invitations sent out to every agent we could think of in town. And they read, you're always saying, uh, you know, let us know when you're, when you're in something. I said, well, now we are, come see us. Well, as a result, several of us got agents, and I, let me say, those Mickey and Judy movies really paid off. <laughs> I, I've had, and I am still having, a great ride, and this prize is the cherry on top of the Sunday. Ta-da! <laughs> but before I act too high and mighty, I'm reminded of a sketch that we did on my show many years ago, Harvey and I, and um, in it, there was a line that I was supposed to say in this sketch <clears throat> that says, um, this didn't belong to me, this belonged to Barbara Brown. And I thought, well, that's not a great name for somebody in a, you know, a comedy sketch. I, if there are any Barbara Browns out here, I, I might I, I don't take it. <laughs> So I, I thought and I thought, and I remembered the name of a girl I went to grammar school with. And I thought, I'll, I'll figure, you know, I, I would use her name. So come the showtime, I changed the line and I said, this didn't belong to me, this belonged to Adrian Lenore Weingart. <laughs> so after the show, my assistant Ray said to me, well, asked where that name came from, and I said, well, it was a girl I went to sixth grade with. I hadn't seen her since. <laughs> so the show, show aired a week later, and then that following Monday, the phone rang in the office, and Ray picked up the call, you know, and, and it was a woman from Nevada who said, I heard my maiden name mentioned on the Burnett show. And so Ray said, oh, 
you must be Miss Weingart. Did you go to Selma Avenue Grammar School in Hollywood? And she said, yes. And she said, well, you and Carol were in the same class. And she said, I don't remember her. <laughs> Well, I have a feeling that after tonight, she will. <laughs> oh. Well, I want to thank, I want to thank PBS, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and a big thank you to the executive producers, Peter and Bob Kaminsky, Mark Krantz, and Cappy McGar. And I'd like to also thank all the wonderful artists who appeared tonight, who, and they came here from all over the country and they took time out of their very busy lives to be with me on this really special occasion. So thank you, Tina, Lucy, Amy, Marty, Bruce, Maya, Rosemary, Rashida, Tony, Bennett, and my chum, Julie, and of course, Vicki and Tim. And of course, thank all of you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so glad we had this time together. Just to have a laugh on something, something, something. <laughs> Seems we just get started, and before you know it, comes a time we have to say so long.